States this week after 14 years in Vietnam. That report next. Five in North Vietnam in 1967 was finally laid to rest today in his own country. Dodge, born and raised in Olympia, Washington, was 31 years old when his plane was shot down over North Vietnam on May 17, 1967. More than 14 years later, the Vietnamese returned his body to the United States. Today he was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. The nation's biggest brokerage house has dealt It will have a population of a little over 57,000 people, Ronald Dodge and two others. After 14 years, Dodge was finally laid to rest today in Arlington National Cemetery. News 4's Washington, D.C. correspondent was there, and Tim Hillard files this report. I'm angry at the Vietnamese because they had my husband alive. They had him in captivity, so obviously they killed him. And I don't know when they killed him, but after they killed him, they didn't even return the body when the rest of the Americans came home. Today, 14 years after being shot down in Vietnam, Navy Captain Ronald Dodge came home to Arlington. He was buried with full honors, a hero to his wife his children, and from Olympia, his parents and brothers and sisters. It was in Olympia where Ron Dodge grew up. He played baseball, went on to the University of Oregon, and in 59 signed with the Seattle Rainiers, then the Navy. A pilot, he was shot down in 67 while over North Vietnam. This picture of Dodge, published first in Paris Match, appeared four months after he was taken prisoner. But when the war ended and POWs were returned, Dodge was not among them. Janice Dodge remembers 14 years of wondering and waiting. It was with tears and roses that she finally said farewell today. But her husband's returned body is, she believes, a sign the Vietnamese are ready to deal. She told News 4 producer Ruth Berry that recent live sightings of POWs assure her that Americans are still in Vietnam. The Vietnamese need money. The U.S. has publicly rejected paying any ransom for information about missing troops. Janice Dodge doesn't say we should be bribed, but we should at least talk. Do you realize how long this has been going on for so many families? It's been going on for well over years that, that Ron went down. Fam 1965? Uh, I think that we ought to deal with them. chose the Navy over baseball, he became a pilot. And on May 17, 1967, he was shot down 52 miles into North Vietnam. His family knew he was alive when his picture, taken by a Dutch freelance photographer, made the cover of life. But there was no further word from Hanoi or the Defense Department until yesterday. And he thought, he thought this war was necessary. He says, Mom, I, I wouldn't be going over there if I didn't think it was worth it. Thursday, Doris King will bury her son after 14 years. Doug Reeves, King 5 News, Olympia.
When we come back, a look at a major challenge for one new West, as Irving R. Levine reports. It took some... ...turned over by Vietnam to the U.S. government last month. Here's more from Mike Nesteroff. Ron Dodge was born and raised in Olympia. He was a star catcher on the high school baseball team and spent part of one season with the Seattle Rainiers Professional Baseball Club before he joined the Navy in 1959. Dodge was in his second tour when his plane went down over North Vietnam in May 1967. It's not known whether he was shot down or his F-8 Crusader malfunctioned, but the last message from him on the ground that day was that he was all right. A few months later, a Dutch photographer took this picture of Dodge being paraded down a Hanoi street. We still don't know how or where or when he died, but his body's back and that's enough for me. That was the most important? Yeah. Just getting him home. Still, Mrs. King is not entirely satisfied, since there are still many unanswered questions about her son's death. I feel so sorry for the ones that that are still over there, that they haven't heard anything either. I kind of attribute our son to his wife pushing this issue that she has for years. And Mrs. King says she's slightly suspicious that all of a sudden a prisoner who no one could account for suddenly was found. Particularly, she says, since Dodge's wife has been active in U.S. groups which won an accounting for... Dodge's wife, Janice, uh, worked with groups that have been divorce, uh, demanding the accounting for 2,500 missing in action servicemen, and she will be discussing her, 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 her efforts and the return of her husband remains tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. Israeli and Palestinian forces exchanged in Vietnam appeared in a French magazine indicating that he was still alive. So he became something of a symbol for all the families of MIAs, those missing in action. Ronald Dodge had been seen alive, on the ground. If he was alive, others might be. And if those men were alive in 1967, why not 1968, or 70, or now? It has always been a flimsy chain of logic, but in the absence of positive evidence of death, Commander Dodge's family kept hoping. So too did the families of Navy Lieutenant Stephen Musselman, shot down in 1972 and the family of Air Force Captain Richard Van Dyke, shot down in 1968. All the families keep hoping. They still do. But for the families of Richard Van Dyke and Stephen Musselman and Ronald Dodge, that is now over. Their bodies have finally been returned by the Vietnamese and identified by the Pentagon. Here's more from John North. A huge C-141 Starlifter brought the remains of the three servicemen to Travis Air Force Base. There was an honor guard and a contingent of high-ranking officers. The bodies were identified in Hawaii after being released by Hanoi on July 7th. First, the coffin holding the remains of Navy Commander Ronald Dodge. Dodge was shot down over North Vietnam on May 17, 1967. Dodge was photographed alive and in captivity that same year. Yet his name did not appear on subsequent prisoner of war lists. Air Force Captain Richard Van Dyke. Van Dyke was shot down on September 11, 1968. Two former POWs have said they saw Van Dyke alive and in captivity after he was shot down. His name was never on a POW list. And Navy Lieutenant Stephen Musselman, whose plane was shot down on September 10, 1972. The North Vietnamese took a picture of Musselman propped against the wreckage of his plane, but it's not known whether he was alive at the time. It was a short and simple ceremony with no relatives attending. Three servicemen listed for more than a decade as missing in action now join the list of more than 55,000 who died in Vietnam. John North, ABC News, Travis Air Force Base, California. For the families of the hundreds of Americans still carried on the books as missing in action in Indochina, hope has receded as the years have passed. But the anguish has remained, the anguish of simply not knowing anything for certain. For three MIA families, that particular pain is now over. We have a report on one of those families from Scott Hammond of KTVX in Salt Lake City. Uh, as painful as many of these questions may be to answer, I, I have to ask you, what do you remember of your father? What, what has it been like growing up for the past, what, 13, 14 years, not even knowing whether your dad is alive? 
Well, I don't remember very much because I was only six. Um, I remember cert certain instances, like the night he left, but other than that, I just know him by pictures. What, what do you mean, the night he left? What do you remember? Well, about? I just remember kissing him goodbye when he left, but that's about all. Your mother has been really a pillar of strength among the, uh, among the families of, of those who are missing in action. And uh, for you, has this, been, has this been something in which you have been personally involved, or is it something that you really have wanted to put behind you? Well, I was... Recently, I've been wanting to be involved. I think it's because I needed to grow up to understand what was going on. I was too young when he left, and until recently when my mother has been involved, I have become interested in it. What has the most difficult part been, the uncertainty? Well, not anymore, now that we know, but it was the uncertainty, not knowing if he was still over there. Well, that's what I meant. I mean, yeah. up, up until now. Yes. And that now, was... how, how, how do you describe... Uh, is, it's, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm stumbling, but it's just that these are, these are difficult questions to ask because none of them sound terribly intelligent, but I'd, I'd, I'm just wondering whether at this point one experiences a feeling of relief. Yeah, that's it. It's relief. Knowing that, you know, knowing that he is accounted for, knowing that he is um, dead is a relief, <laughs> in a way, so to speak. Instead of being over there for years from now and just not knowing. Ethel Musselman, you were, you were approaching this whole problem from, from the other end of the age spectrum. This was your son who was over there. There wasn't any question of not knowing or not understanding what was going on. That's can, can you at least share that same feeling of relief now that, now, now that you know for sure? No, I think people expect me to have that same feeling that Wendy might have or the Van Dykes, but truly uh, it is not so much a feeling of relief as it is the opening of a wound that was beginning to heal because uh, for a long time uh, his uh, widow Jeannie and I uh, had given up the fact that he would come back. We had given over to the idea that he did die when his plane went down and um, that he was in the spiritual realm so that um, really when we had our memorial service after the Navy pronounced him KIA in 1978, uh, this was to me a sort of funeral for him. And then when you heard that his, his body was being sent, well, you didn't know it was his body being sent back. When and how did you find out that, that your son was among those who had been identified? Just yesterday afternoon, uh, Jeannie, uh, his uh, wife formerly, called me and uh, told me she was very emotional, and I became very emotional too because for us it was starting all over again. And uh, then a little while after Jeannie called, two Navy officers from Shreveport contacted me. And it was um, for the same purpose of notifying me. You know, Mrs. Musselman, this is, as you know, a, a continuing agony for the families of the other 2,500 who don't yet know. Is yes. it possible to give advice to them? Well, um, it it for me was much easier to accept the fact that he had died and was in the spiritual realm. I do believe that God takes care of us here and beyond here. Uh, I think it would have uh, been easier for many of them to give up uh, instead of continuing to uh, torture themselves with false hopes. Uh, but of course each person has to think and believe and trust uh, as, as he can. Uh, but I have uh, been more comfortable, I think, and have been happier having given him over as dead a long time ago. Uh, Wendy Dodge, I, uh, this is another tough question to throw at you, but I wonder if, if you have any ideas uh, of, of why the Vietnamese would have kept your, your father's body and the bodies of the other men all these years and not admit that they had them. Have you and your mother talked about that ever? Yes, um, I know they did that with the Korean War. And um, from what I understand is that there was an agreement between the United States and North Vietnam that we would um, give them money to repair the country after the war. And we didn't. 
and it's their way of trying to deal with the United States and to hold back and to return three bodies at a time and say, we're ready to deal, are you? And they're just trying to use us in that way. So if you're right, then this kind of process will, will continue over a great many more years or until the deal, as you put it, is, is finished. Right. All right. Well, Ethel Musselman, Wendy Dodge, thank you both very much indeed. In a moment, we'll examine the question of why Vietnam decided to turn over the remains of three missing Americans at this point. We'll talk with a former Pentagon official.